Namaste, friends, and welcome. Um, we've had our guest who I'm having a conversation with here tonight, Kate Johnson, here before on this podcast. And I'm like so excited to have Kate back. Now, Kate is a teacher, and I'm just doing my kind of more formal introduction, an author, a facilitator. Key domain is integrating meditation and social justice work and has had many years working with individuals and organizations. And Kate's a dear friend. You know, Kate, Kate and I are close colleagues and friends. We've taught together at meditation retreats and are very involved together leading this teacher training for mindfulness teachers with a particular emphasis within that on creating like a super robust leading edge program and training on diversity, equity, inclusivity, and accessibility. So that's like been a big, exciting area we've been working together on. Most immediately, I want you to know about Kate's new book. It's Radical Friendship. Oh my gosh, it's fresh, it's brilliant, it's transformational. Please read it. And we're gonna be discussing it. So you'll hear a lot more now over the next little bit of time. So, dear one, welcome, Kate. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tara. It's really nice to be with you today. I am glad. I'm so glad we're doing this. So I'm going to start in with, like, this is the mo most traditional question you've probably already gotten on <laughs> every podcast you've ever done <laughs> recently. And this is, okay, the book's called Radical Friendship. And there's a lot of radicals out there now and mea culpa you know i know i've contributed <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really strong word so i'm i want want to hear what drew you what started you off really wanting to focus on friendship and how come radical friendship was there any like um personal experience or event or something that made just the 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 language of friendship important mm -hmm. to you mm. Yeah, I feel like it was kind of a slow dawning of this is the this is the topic that I really love to focus on for this work. Um, and it did come out of a an interest in you know diversity and inclusion and, and accessibility and and really looking for ways to the support the Sangha that I was in to do um, social justice work better and with less harm. And what we were finding is that we were um, attempting to um, show up for various social justice campaigns this is in New York City and um, that sometimes in those engagements and sometimes just within our community that there was you know, a lot of harm happening across differences and that um, we didn't really have a, a framework rooted in the Dharma for how to how we wanted to be together, how we wanted to be with each other. Um, and so I think you know, reflecting back on some of my earlier experiences going to a meditation center um, and also my early experiences going to you know, be a part of um, social justice actions and direct actions and stuff. It, it was both to learn, you know, learn meditation or to show up for a cause, but it was also because I wanted to be with other people who were kind of like me and, and cared about the same things. Um, and so there, and it was something that I'd never really talked about, or even I think acknowledged to myself out loud, that like part of the reason why I'm here isn't just to learn, you know, what the Buddha taught, but it's to be around people that I think might be kindred spirits. Um, and then I think when you know, I experienced a misunderstanding or I, you know, offended someone or you know, one, of, one of those relational kind of friction moments happen within within Sangha within people, a group of people who feel like kindred spirits, it can hurt even more because there's this wish that oh, if I just find people who have the same values and are studying the same thing, maybe we won't have those um, relational like not, you know, it'll be a little more smooth than than say the general public, it doesn't seem to be true. So um, part of what was exciting was finding that within the Buddhist teaching, there were actually so many um, beautiful teachings about relationship that we could lean into to um, really build the kind of community that I think we all dreamed of. Um, yeah, and then I think on a personal note, um, 
I mentioned this in the book, I think friendship is something I've already always really longed for. It's something that I haven't, um, I haven't always found easy. I still don't find easy. <laughs> um, I think it's a intimate relationship in which, you know, I find that for me and for many people I talk to, it brings up stuff um, around I mean, many of the, the topics you teach about so beautifully belonging and vulnerability and worthiness. And um, so I really wanted to kind of zoom in and focus on this, this relationship. And I think when it made, when it made the transition from being uh, to describing it as radical friendship, the idea there was that, and the, the Buddha called it spiritual friendship, Kalyanamita. And um, I think the invitation there is that we can look at friendship as a spiritual practice um, and one that helps us to develop and enrich our inner lives. And also that we can support each other on, on a common path to liberation. Um, and to do so in these times struck me as a really radical proposition and the the potential of that kind of friendship or that kind of bond um, to be forged uh, you know, among among people in a community to me felt like this possibility of um, strengthening communities, strengthening movement spaces in a way that we could really um, stay together and not only tolerate each other, but love each other long enough to affect real change. Mm. I love the way you put it that radical friendship is a spiritual practice and a superpower. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm, I'm right with you on the emphasis on friendship. I mean, many people listening might know that the poly word meta, you know, one of the descriptions of it is friendliness. And I've always felt like if, if we threw away all the spiritual paths in the world and all we paid attention to was cultivating that quality of friendliness, everything else <laughs> would come out of that. It just, it mm. just opens up and wakes up our heart. And right before we started, you and I were talking about what it was like putting out a new book and all the natural insecurities that come with it. And I was wondering if you would share how radical friendship and that friendliness towards yourself is holding a space for that like what's coming up around that for you yeah sure yeah well um this is my first book <laughs> and uh people keep encouraging me to say first book and not last book because it was really <laughs> 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 it was not easy to write uh you know for the the technical parts of writing and um just you know learning how to yeah, structure a large text like this and um, to have it be varied enough and cohesive enough and the, just the right mix of elements that would make it um, like readable and accessible and and, and beneficial. Um, and then and then there's also the part of um, putting something out in the world that other people are going to see that once they're once it's out, I can't change it, um, that it's probably going to have things in it that I intend and things in it that I I didn't intend, but are there anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I, like I was mentioning before we talked, I have um, been on several podcasts and there was one day where I, um, there was a one of the first ones that I recorded was coming out. And at the same time, I had several friends text me or email me and just say that they were appreciating the book and they were giving specific feedback. So I knew they actually read the book and weren't just, you know, mm -hmm. um, saying that and then you know had this wave of mental cloud roll and say like oh they're not they don't really mean it you know they're just saying that um and i could see it but it didn't make it less pain less painful um and well i'm not sure that that's true i it i could seeing it it both makes it more and less painful in a way, like uh, to become aware of those, the presence of, of thoughts like that, that I think are indicative of, you know, um, like not feeling worthy of praise and self-doubt around, you know, what I had to say and whether it was good enough to share and um, that the thoughts themselves are painful. And it's also painful to know that, um, I mean, if you love someone, you don't want them to think badly of themselves. And I feel that way about myself, you know, like, so there's this sense of, like, oh, wow, I wrote this whole book about friendliness and here I am kind of not able to trust my friends when they tell me something I did was really mattered to them. Um, and 
yeah, I've been working with uh, another round of Metta practice again. I thought, okay, well, this is a good time to do some intensive, intensive friendliness practice towards myself. Um, and in terms of a radical friendship practice, I think one of the ways that that experience has been made less personal for me is to see how those thoughts about um, what I created, not having enough value or not being good enough to be seen by other people, that they're on some level personal, but they're also societal, right? That there's um, really a way in which the publishing industry, you know, the Buddhist world, society at large has not always felt that people like me deserve um, a voice and a platform and to be seen and heard. And so um, allowing myself to be seen and heard brings up, you know, the messages that I think I've received my whole life, um, you know, despite the best intentions of my, you know, family and friends, <laughs> teachers who tried to protect me from those, those, um, yeah, that, that conditioning. So, um, there is something about seeing that too. I think that 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 helps to know, like it's not just a personal failing that I don't have, you know, quote unquote high self esteem, or it's not just that um, my family somehow failed me, but that also um, there's a there's a structural layer to that um, that I'm experiencing as personal mm. in this moment. Mm. Wow. So there's there's two really powerful things here. I just heard you say, and I I want to break them apart and pursue both of them. Okay. <laughs> so the first one was that when you saw the self-doubt and you really could feel just the pain of it, it's like it hurts to be hurting ourselves with those kind of thoughts. Then the first part of radical friendship is really knowing how to hold yourself in some way, um, you know, and being kind to yourself. And you, in the book, you just, you have really beautiful teachings on how to bring that self-care in. Mm. And then the second piece that you named, which feels really important, and this is the one I think we miss, is that those thoughts aren't really our own thoughts. We're thinking society's thoughts, as Kate Johnson once said, that I, I'm quoting you, I think, <laughs> which is not, I'm not thinking my thoughts, I'm thinking society's thoughts, which is that that sense of of not being worthy of being attended to is um, built into our society as the message that uh, those of color, black people of color, indigenous, it's just thrown in there over and over again that these are not the voices, the intelligence, the messages, this isn't the source of the, the, the wisdom and what's guiding our society. So you're, stepping forward with something and meeting a kind of a societal attitude. And you do a fantastic job in this book about helping us not take personally things that are really, um, can, we're conditioned by the larger society. So I kind of want to ask you to speak more about how you see our societal structures shaping and impacting our relationships with ourself, like the trance of unworthiness and with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the internalization of these kind of external messages, both um, subtle and overt about, you know, where you belong and the value of our life and um, the yeah, role we should have in society and the role we should not have in society, um, you know, often shows up in this kind of, um, you know, internalized way. We talk about internalized oppression or um, in, in the Buddhist world, we talk a lot about the inner inner critic. Um, there's a, a amazing artist and performer, Tourmaline, who said, um, encourages people to work with their inner police, which I think is really uh, powerful for BIPOC folks and for other people who are overly policed in the society, you know, the ways in which there's this voice that says like, oh, don't do that. Um, you know, uh, you're going to, you're going to get hurt. Someone's going to, someone's going to hurt you if you, if you step out of line. Um, and so there's, yeah, the, the knowing of it when it arises and the naming of it and the, um, willingness to uh 
not necessarily even do battle with it, but to bring up enough quality of love and um, and connection with ourselves or with another another person or even with the you know the earth itself, um, but a, a, a quality of friendship that can actually help um, that that inner critic or that inner police uh, settle, um, be less be less in charge. Um, and when it comes to our relationships with one, with one another, I mean, I think it happens in in different ways. Um, I talk a little bit in the book about the characteristics of white supremacy culture, so many of which seem to be um, expressed relationally in terms of, uh, you know, a sense of individualism and the tendency to isolate and, um, uh, you know, kind of vying for control and power and defensiveness and, you know, that um, there's a way in which the societal structures that empower and give privilege to um, white people, but also, you know, to other folks with societal privilege, um, also impact the way that we we relate, um, even even among white folks, as from what I hear, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, and certainly even in communities of color, um, you know, it it has been such an amazing um, movement, I think over the last several decades to have uh, designated affinity groups for those of us who experience oppression within society in a certain way to come together and to be in a safer space together. So we have, you know, BIPOC groups that meet and we have um, uh, LGBTQIA groups. Uh, women's groups had been operating before that, you know, we started having women's retreats, you know, um, even earlier. Um, and I think the hope sometimes is that by getting rid of not getting but by you know having a space that's separate from um, folks who are um, you know representing or embodying the dominant culture that we can have you know more safety and less of the um, the societal structures of oppression that kind of wear us down on a daily day-to-day -day basis i think what we often find in those groups um, is that there's some of that and there's also been some internalization of that those power struggles that then start to manifest even within a group even when dominant culture folks aren't present you know and so uh, what what's nice about it is that um it seems to be easier and more simple to work with um, in an affinity space um, if there's not an us and them if it's all us um, then there's a certain kind of healing that can occur there um, so i think you know in writing the book part of my question was like am i writing this book specifically for people who want to connect across across a difference you know like for white people and people of color who want to you know partner together on something or you know um queer folks and straight folks or like men and women. Um, I think that's part of it, but I also think part of it is like, how are we all unconsciously replicating some of these dynamics in our in our in our relationships with ourselves and our our partnerships and our, our families and communities, um, even though even though we don't really want to. I think that's so important because it's pervasive. In other words, the the impact of I think it's a hierarchical society where, and this is not, this is through, through history, many or most societies and many animal, other animals too, you know, mm -hmm. not just humans, create hierarchies where there's superior and inferior. And some hierarchies are absolutely practical and useful, but a lot of them, especially in human hierarchies, end up being oppressive and separating people. And so, it does we don't even have to look at people of over difference. Most of us can be with anybody else. And there's this immediate comparing that goes on. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're so much prettier, you know, mm -hmm. or you, you know, or you're heavier, or you're lighter, or you're more intelligent, or you're more successful, or you have more this or more that. And we put ourselves up and down in like a flash, yeah. in a flash. So part of it is getting just the toxicity of that because I made a whole practice for myself around it that because this, this understanding that if there's anything but truly feeling 
our fundamental equality, then love is hindered. Mm -hmm. And then to sense how much more so it happens when there's the real over differences where we have real, um, real imprinting to automatically say, oh, you're a black person, you're less if, if you're a white person saying that. So I'm with you on the need for affinity groups completely because we have to have some degree of safety to begin to acknowledge and recognize how that all plays out so that we can begin to not be caught by it. And then we can widen the circles and widen the circles. And, I, and so I'm with you. I wanted to share with you and those listening something I heard from uh, Nikki Giovanni, poet, wonderful person, black woman says in it, this is an interview that she recorded 40 years ago with James Baldwin, that wow. she's saying this 40 years ago, and it's very cool. And she says about how in her generation, she says, one of the nice things was that they could say, hey, I don't like white people. And then that was the beginning, of course, of being able to like them. Hmm. And I found that so powerful because it's very hard to admit what conditioning does to us. And yet, when I started thinking about it, it's like, of course, there's going to be dislike. How could there not be when there's generations of traumatic vi violence to the black body by from the white body? Mm -hmm. How could there not be distrust, right. you know, a feeling of distrust and fear and anger, you know, given those that brutality? And how could it not be that white people wouldn't pick up that and then on that pick up the anger the fear the mistrust and then themselves feel endangered and angry back plus of course white people don't want to feel bad about themselves mm -hmm. so since they don't want to feel guilt and shame they then deny and further separate of course there's all this programmed reactivity and what if we could not make ourselves personally bad for that and i feel like this is where I want to turn to you, Kate, because we take it personally. And there's a way that you write that says, wait a minute, this is, this is all the society's institutions are creating these feelings and reactions that are playing out. It's not our fault. And yet it's not, it's like, as Nikki says, until we can admit, oh, here's how it's happening. We don't have a chance of going beyond it and really feeling our our togetherness. So what helps us not take it so personally, what the society's doing? Yeah. What helps us not take it so personally? I didn't write about this in the book. I, I started to, and then this, this was something that ended up on the editing block. But um, I think that there's something that is helpful in the Buddhist understanding of the self that is um, really powerful for this particular kind of practice and learning that um, to be able to really contemplate and intimately be in touch with the the way that the self is um, kind of built up over time and, and almost like um, less of a thing and more like a process. And then in the process of becoming a self that there are, you know, we, we absorb elements from the environment and they become incorporated in this thing that we think of as me. Um, but they actually didn't, they didn't start out as me and they kind of got, you know, kind of consumed or integrated in this way. Um, and of course, you know, not all of those aspects of self or societal messaging, you know, there's like likes and dislikes and there's, you know, <laughs> family traits and there's um you know it's made up of so much but to see i think the societal conditioning that lends us towards comparison lends us towards fear lends us towards um se separation and the suffering that follows as um, something that we've we picked up so more i have this rather than i am this mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah that seems to be helpful uh, to me. Um, that, that really resonates because as you said that I was thinking, cause I spent uh, a number of years in affinity group with white people looking at 
my own bias and reactivities. And the more I heard everybody saying, yeah, and I feel that too, and other people too, I realized that, okay, so this is, this is the kind of messaging from society. It's the imprint. It's not who we are at essence, just the way you're saying it got added on to that sense of our own being and solidified there. And so then I wasn't taking as personally the fact that I would feel uh, I would judge others as less than me right. on a flash. I didn't take it. I wasn't like, oh, I'm a judgmental, bigoted person. It's more, oh, that kind of judgment and bias is just absolutely the air I've been breathing. Mm -hmm. Well, and that happens too. I mean, I think that's another way where the sense of like personalness gets gets agitated is to be in a group with other people who are all saying, oh gosh, me too, me, you know, I, I have that also. So it's it's not so much this, again, this personal feeling, but it's this shared experience. And, you know, one of the things that came up for me, you know, as you are saying the, um, that quote from Nikki Giovanni, which I think is so, you know, hilarious and also powerful is like, when we go into these affinity spaces, it often seems that like white people don't even like white people very much. You know, like there's this feeling of the you know the more that I've done this this kind of work and training with different organizations, the more I hear people say, um, you know, I don't want to be lumped in. Like that lumping in with other white people seems to be this real pain point. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Can you? Yeah, <laughs> what, I what's think that about? it's. I think it's part of that. I don't want to feel bad about myself, and I think white people are waking up to the reality of the horror. I, th I think we're waking up to the reality of generations of violating people and considering them less than and other. And so we want to be more woke and we don't want to be identified with those that are less woke. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we're just trying really hard not to feel bad about ourselves. And I know, speaking personally, in addition to being in a affinity group with white people. I was also in a mixed group for uh, three years where we were really looking at who are we together. And mm -hmm. for the beginning, I was embarrassed to be one of the white people. And I didn't want to be identified as the white people. And I realized how self-conscious I was all the time. I wasn't liking myself or the other white people because of kind of just what we're talking about is taking personally um, all the history and also the fact that it's still in my body mind, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, the biases and so on. And then it was, and here's what really grabs me, Kate, that it took me a long time to catch was that the more, the more I was identified as part of a bad group and not wanting to be, the less I was actually feeling any connection or real compassion or empathy or friendliness. And it wasn't until I started not taking it as personally and just saying, okay, this is the conditioning of a society that I actually could start feeling grief for the, the real suffering of my friends mm -hmm. and also a real sense of friendliness. And that was a, um, that was a revelation that I could not get to the place of grieving and loving until I woke up out of the shame and stopped mm -hmm. taking it so personally. Wow. That's huge, actually. And I, I'm really um, grateful for you sharing that because um, I have, I've been witnessing something in one of the spaces where I'm like responsible for kind of managing affinity groups and you know in the in a process of learning about diversity and equity within the mindfulness teachings and um one of the things that i it's been a struggle let's just say it's been a struggle and um and part of it is that you know folks who are um white don't want to be lumped in with other white folks and but part and one of the things that i've noticed in that um and people seem to be saying that which which feels really real and valid is that you know hey hold up like i have pain too and yes i have white skin but you know i come from poor people i come from immigrants i come from refugees i come from you know um from people who have been um, outcast from society you know or i 
there's alcoholism in my family or, you know, I, I, I have disabilities. I'm queer, you know, so there's, there's, um, there's this feeling like, I guess I've been wondering if it is possible for people to um, truly empathize with another group's suffering um, in, in an experience where they may be benefiting from the same system that that harms their their friends or you know the, the people they care about um, is it possible to feel empathy without first having their own pain acknowledged because that's that was is what people seem to be calling for in that space it's like hey you know yes i'll see the, this other person's pain but you got to see mine first or two um and i think that's valid um, and I and I get that, and I also really appreciate you saying what I'm hearing you say is that it's possible to do it to find that place also through letting go of some of the shame of being being in that dominant group or coming from people who may have harmed in ways that you wouldn't have chosen. Um, is that am I getting you right? You're getting me right, and you're adding a layer that I think is really important. I feel like, you know, there's an understanding that the heart of Buddhism is compassion, the heart of compassion is compassion for ourselves. And so if we're, in, if, if you and I are together, and I want to have compassion for the suffering that you have experienced being born in a black body, and I'm with you right now, and right now I'm still feeling a clench because my mother was an alcoholic because I came from a Jewish family because I knew different types of caste systems. If I'm still feeling that in my body, um, I have to first acknowledge and be with and feel tenderness towards my own suffering. Always have to start there mm -hmm. or else I won't be embodied and tender enough to really include yours authentically. So first I have to feel mine. I have to feel, yes, this body mind has suffered too. And I have to and feel the collective holding that, you know, others caring. And I have to not feel shame for the fact that your that my actions are involved with your suffering. I have to know it's not personal, it's not what I wish. Mm -hmm. It's just the the karma of how these societies have unfolded so those are the two kind of prerequisites because my shame will block my care yeah that feels very powerful to me because it also feels like like everything doesn't have to happen all in the same moment which i think is really a challenge when facilitating a group and starting to unpack some of these this material is like everybody wants everything to happen at exactly the same time you know you see my pain i see your pain we acknowledge all you know and, and we all tell our story and that you know it not only isn't practical just in terms of how time works but it also um uh it does seem like there needs to be space for each each one to be seen on its own um and we have to start somewhere um and and so I love the idea that there might be this, you know, in another time and space, work, you know, working with um, compassion towards you know, my own history and um, my own wounds and ability to hold them in such a way that when I show up with you and you're saying, "Can you see? Can can you see the way I'm hurting?" Um, that I could I could potentially do that without needing to kind of co-op that space or rip open my, you know, my, my scars so you can see them too. Is that, yeah. So what you're, you're pointing and you, you're pointing to something else that feels really important in relationships, whether it's just two of us or a group, which is we can't meet everybody's needs all at once at the same time. So right. there's sometimes we're going to have to live with feeling uncomfortable and you have a great chapter endure what is hard to endure and <laughs> you really you invite us forward in a very powerful way kate in this book about making an effort and it's a wise effort that stretches and enlarges us and i feel like endure what is hard to endure if we really want to build the bridges and reconnect and know the 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 kind of depth of the truth of oneness on the way, we have to be able to be really uncomfortable. 
we have to be willing. So I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little more to that because you've, you, you have some fantastic examples in the book and it's such a powerful teaching. <laughs> yes, I know about being uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. I mean, I think, um, I think you're right. Uh, I think the Buddha was right, you know, about this, um, quality of endurance and the ability to, um, to stay with an experience over time. I think that's part of why, um, it is so helpful to do. And so, um, such an awakening experience to do this kind of practice within, a relationship like friendship because there is a kind of commitment over time um, and because we do have the sense that we're going to be able to come back and address the things that we didn't get at last time you know and that we don't have to do everything all at once um, but that we're in we're committed to kind of this process of unfolding together uh, i think it's really special when it happens within two among two people i think it's really special when it happens within a community and i love you know what you're talking about with these you know, containers of several years long where you really decide to stick with each other, you know, in the messiness and in the mistakes and in the, you know, um, I mean, you're talking about your own process is being a part of that group and how that evolved and I'm imagining it was happening for each of you individually and then for the group as a whole and um, to say there's enough good here and there's enough possibility here um, that we can stay together even even through the hard parts and there's not that's not always the case yeah. you know and that's something that i mean in the process of writing the book i think i became <laughs> for every statement that i made about friendship i could think about some examples where that wouldn't be appropriate <laughs> you know like um and and i really want to qualify here that i think that the friendship that the buddha taught and the friendship that i hope to talk about in the book isn't the same as just you know being nice and you know keeping things cool and be you know smiling a lot and you know that there's this there's this other area of um wise effort and i would say joyful effort that's involved um but um yeah I think part of radical friendship is um, both knowing when there's enough um, goodness to stay in a relationship through the hard times. And there's also, you know, being able to be honest when we say, actually, there's, there's not enough here for me to um, engage with this, this other person or this group or this community um, and not abandon myself in the process. Um, mm both are true and both are a part of the practice and it and that's what makes it less like a a set of rules and do's and don'ts and more like a more like a practice it's a living practice and and i really love what i'm hearing which is at the root of it for me to have a radical friendship with myself i have to have a commitment i have to really have kind of a trust that this is the path that's going to be most liberating and a commitment to hang in that that I have to be willing to stand behind myself. And I mean, I remember in my own life, the kind of several times where it became very clear that if I wanted to keep waking up, I had to really dedicate myself to loving myself and to healing, like mm -hmm. just to, it was really a feeling of commitment. I am committed to not staying in the trance of unworthiness. And that was like a, an act of radical friendship to myself, that level of commitment. And then the effort comes out of that. It's like, that's the, the efforts, the energy towards what really matters. And it's the same thing with each other. For you and I to have a radical friendship, it means that we have to have that sense of really trusting the mutuality that we're both willing to hang in. Mm -hmm. And then we have the capacity to hang in. And I think then it widens to a group that you're with. How can you have radical friendship in a group? Well, you have to have the group really committed to enduring what's hard to endure. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Right. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I suddenly, um, oh, this teaching that, um, Sharon Salzberg gave one time came to mind of um, she talked about it was like the practical practicality of meta and the the kind of 
it, we were living in um, New York City at the time, and she said metta is like the feeling that you would feel um, with a group of people. Like, say, she said she advocated for practicing metta on the subway, and she said, but it's not just that you're on the subway for with these people until you get to 59th street. She's like, you do meta as if you're on the subway with this, these people forever. <laughs> like, so oh, that's great. <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah. It gives it a different flavor. Yeah. And there are different levels of how engaged we are with people. You know, if you're married to somebody, your radical friendship, it's a very deep, deep commitment to um, hang in and be with what's difficult with each other. Um, you're much more going to be spending the time on that. So I was kind of wondering if maybe you could share an example from your life where you and a somebody who's different from you, a person of difference, how you cultivated a radical friendship with them with real authentic relating, like what helped to grow it? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I really believe is that whenever we're relating with another person, we're relating across a difference of some kind, you know, whether it's, you know, any of the many characteristics that make up who our social selves are. So I think in some Got ways it. I could talk yeah. about any single, any relationship. <laughs> any relationship. However, <laughs> when I think about, you know, I do focus on racial justice a lot in the book just to have a, have a lens. And so there's one friend that uh, has been, I've been friends with for, well over a decade at this point, we worked together in um, uh, yoga space in New York. And um, I remember one time where I was talking to him um, and I was expressing something I didn't like. And I used this language that I, I wouldn't use today, but I said, um, you know, oh, this is so lame and that's so lame. And, you know, uh, he um, happened to have a partner who, um, has a disability and um, I could tell something was happening with his face, but I wasn't yet at a place where I was willing to just, you know, ask, um, which by the way, I think is also a really important practice in friendship is that often we actually know when something's not quite right and to be able to slow down and not and ask rather than kind of continue to barrel forth, <laughs> brush over um, the facial expression or the kind of moment of tension in the body, but that's what I did. And then at some point he said, you know, what do you mean by that? Lame. And I kind of caught myself. I thought, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't right. You know, and I, I, um, I said, oh, I mean, it just doesn't work well. It's kind of wonky. And it's like, you know, a little bit off and kind of sucks. And he's like, yeah, you know, that, that word, I know my, my partner, it would really hurt her if she heard that word, because it's something that people have said to, um, you know, people who have physical disabilities for a long time to make them feel less than and and immediately I was just so shamed you know like oh my god like how could I do this like um yeah identification with the one who knows and is you know woke as you say and and um and oh my gosh I did this and and um and I felt like he was really gracious about it and he just said um you know we kind of brainstormed together like what are some of the other words we could say <laughs> that got at that feeling but that didn't didn't kind of create harm and i i feel like the way that he approached me in that moment was so so tender and so gentle um and even though i was the person who was you know, had said something harmful um that he didn't lose sight of my humanity in that moment um and part of that is that we actually had um we had a relationship. Um, so we had all this other context for me to draw on. And, um, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> I brought a new level of awareness to the way that I speak and, you know, the potential to, um, you know, use my speech in a way that, that hurt, that helps and, and doesn't hurt. But also like, I think that it was a real teaching around how to like being, being lovingly called in. And I know that, um, there's more of a discourse now kind of in the culture at large around calling in and calling out. And of course now even, you know, <laughs> cancel culture seems to be co-opted by people who really shouldn't be using that word. And, uh, you know, like that there's like, um, how we, how we handle each other in those moments of, 
of, of screwing up, um, especially when we're um, working together across a difference of some kind feels like a real example of radical friendship to me. And it also meant that in the future, because this is a white man, you know, when we had stuff that came up around race and um, power that I felt like I could I could share with him too, you know, that this is how mm, this impacted mm, me. Or, mm, mm. Um, and so we, I think in that process developed a kind of spiritual consent with one another where um, we have a commitment to um, helping each other see what the other doesn't see. Mm. Um, and mm. that, that feels like a powerful partnership. And it's not that it's not, it's not that we live happily ever after, like we still have issues with one another. And there's, mm-hmm. there's, you know, we, we go through periods of time where we just need space from one another because the relationship feels like it's a lot of work or something, you know, but, um, but we find our way back to each other. Uh, I think that's actually a part of our friendship too. That's important is that um, we allow space. Mm. So you're, you're naming, elements of radical friendship that I think really help us ground this conversation. Um, the, the given is that we will rub each other wrong. The given is that we hurt each other, actually. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and what I'm hearing you say is that's not a problem. That does not have to be a problem that we hurt each other. What makes it kind of grounds for transformation is how we then deal with it. Can we be honest and speak to each other, not from aggression, but as he did, just there was a tenderness and a realness. Can you take it in and learn and grow? You know, it's like, can we go ahead and hurt each other and rub each other wrong and find ways to respond Mm -hmm. that actually end up deepening trust? I mean, I find that in my marriage that that it's not that we're that we lack you know our edges hitting each other it's more that the each time they do and we can navigate with honesty and kindness we end up having more space of trust Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know and i also love that that your relationship has room for moving in and out it's like the wings of the bird that go up and down it's like we we're not always open-hearted that's okay we're not always wanting to be close that's okay there's enough trust to let people go in and out in an authentic friendship in and out meaning of the level of contact right right i like that you bring up the way that you know radical friendship plays out in something like a marriage, you know, and um, I've been thinking more and more about, you know, if there's some kind of like formal commitment I want to start making with my friends, you know, or some kind of ceremony to say, hey, we're, you know, many of my radical friendships have evolved to be that way over time. But um, that's one thing that kind of sparked my mind. The other thing that came up for me as I was listening to you, it's, um, you know, I'm in a romantic partnership too, you know, experiencing many of the same kind of dynamics of, yeah, like how, intentionally hurting each other, finding a way to repair. One of the things that I was reading recently is um, it's from the Gottman Institute. They talk about um, how for every moment of hurt, there has to be, you know, several moments of love and tenderness and care mm. to actually make that possible. Like, like, like I think they said a five to one ratio, essentially. Mm. Like, for every moment of separation, there's got to be five of connection to actually mm. um, uh, make that to keep the relationship strong and healthy. Um, And that's, you know, if there's any, of course, when you write a book, what I hear is that everyone feels this way. There's things that they would have written now that they didn't include. And I think I did, I like the book that I wrote. I think if I wrote another one again, I would would include that also, you know, that like how, how important it is for us to also, you know, celebrate our friends and, you know, gas them up and tell them they look beautiful and, you know, like remind them what we appreciate about them and allow our, our love to show up on our faces for them. And, um, you know, just these gestures of, um, appreciation and care, I think also, um, build the foundation for being able to weather these, these hard parts that inevitably Mm. come. That's a takeaway. Thank you. Five to one. <laughs> I'm going to remember. I'm going to be talking five to one to Jonathan. <laughs> so 
you know, part of this, what it makes me think about is you have, again, your teachings invite us to stretch. And I, and I kind of think it's a cool idea, like, hey, you want to be radical friends, you know, and then actually having the consciousness that, oh, we're committed to stretching more, we're committed to investigating more, we're committed to nurturing more, at least mm -hmm. five to one scale, you know, yeah. I think that's a great idea. And one of the things you talk about is giving what's hard to give. And your kind of realizations around time. And I think, I just want to hear you say some more about it because I feel like our society is so diseased around time and around rushing and around speed and around, you know, we have, we all have so much fear of failure and like, I have to get more done. I have to check this off the list. I'm going to miss the plane that we don't do the five to one. So mm -hmm. Can you speak a little more about time? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I put it in the chapter on heart giving what is hard to give because I think what comes up immediately is, you know, money and material resources. It's like, oh, what, what do I, you know, how I, how how might I stretch myself to express generosity, even, you know, being willing to give what's like a little bit difficult, right? Um, not just kind of what's comfortable. Um uh, in service of supporting someone else who really needs it or um, supporting liberation in some way. Um, and then right after that, my thought was, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, it's associated with money actually. And I think that's part of it, you know, in a capitalist society, they, they're, they're linked, um, but uh, time, you know, yeah. and um, in everything that we've talked about so far, time is kind of the secret ingredient. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to, um, pause and offer a kind word or um, call each other in lovingly or listen wholeheartedly or speak really honestly and directly or, you know, express any appreciation, like all of these things require require time. And um, in the book, I talk about learning that as a parent, you know, I'm, I'm a parent of a, a baby, a, a seven month old. Um, and then I also have a, a bonus kid for my uh, my partner's previous relationship, who's twelve now, um, and yeah, that that relationship with with my my stepdaughter is where I really got it, um, uh, because I had been living this like very fast life, you know, in an urban setting, and um, and really as a single adult living my on my own. Um, was in charge of my time all the time, you know, and I decided when I ate and how, how long something took. And, um, I didn't really have to coordinate with other people very much and to, to meet someone who, um, really went at her own pace and her pace was like the pace of wonder, you know, it wasn't like she was being obstructionist. It was like, she is so, um, excited about the world around her and her own body and our relationship. And, you know, that things just take longer. <laughs> <laughs> and um and yeah i'm so grateful for her to her for teaching me to slow down and teaching me that um not only it's to slow down but also that me not always being in charge of my time is is a good thing actually mm -hmm. that allowing someone else to lead and mm -hmm. to go at their pace um and to you know hang in with them, you know, for as long as it takes, you know, them to move through a particular, you know, getting ready for school or conversation, you know, that, 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 um, you know, in the, in the case of my stepdaughter, often it just makes like a life a lot more fun, you know, but in <laughs> case of other, other relationships, it just, um, I get to, I just learn so much and get to discover so much more than I would if I was just in charge all the time. Um, yeah, and I do think, uh, I do think it's really heartbreaking what, um, our culture and economic systems have done to our sense of time and never having enough and not having enough to give. Um, and I think that friendship is a place where we can really resist, resist that slide into, you know, a more mechanized way of <laughs> inhabiting ourselves in the world you know and to really be um acknowledging that you know human beings need time to be together need time to do nothing need time to rest need time to linger or pause or dawdle or 
Um, and what I love about friendship is that, you know, even, even more than like a romantic relationship or a parenting or other kinds of relationship that have these explicit, um, uh, commitments, you know, friendship as we have it now really exists in this like, totally, at least the radical friendship that I think the Buddha is talking about this totally non-transactional space, mm. um, where what we get is the relationship. <laughs> mm, mm. That is the win. Yeah. And that's beautifully said, non-transactional space that we're actually in it for just the sake of love and connectedness. And, and that takes time. It's like paying attention. Yeah. If I can really listen to you, if I can really pay attention and put down my agenda, uh, what fills that space is a sense of connectedness. And, you know, you were speaking about radical friendship, and I was thinking about the suffering of our earth and how, you know, part of the hierarchy of our societies that's so toxic is that humans feel disconnected from the earth. Mm -hmm. Like, earth is separate, and, and we, we, we're, we're above other species, so we get to dominate them, we get to consider the earth as our disposal for, you know, getting resources and using it as a sewer. It's like a real, it's the opposite of friendship, you know? Mm -hmm. And that the first time I ever realized I truly wasn't alone, that I could never be alone was in nature. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, this, that just this sense of this living body is part of this living earth. And, and I started a practice out of that that I've shared recently about uh, a number of times because I keep doing it and it's just such a live one, which is just reflecting on uh, we are friends, you know, and, and, and seeing a tree and saying we are friends or the geese that I watch a lot and or the plants or the birds and, and then I'm beginning to grow up and extend it to people, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I do, Kate, in the moments that like, and I'm just sensing it right now with you that we are friends it immediately bursts forth into living manifested reality. And, and, and so it feels like, how are we going to save our earth if we don't feel a sense of loving friendliness with, with this earth, with this creation? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know for me, it's part of why I, you know, I'm, I eat plant-based is, is just, it's a suffering of other living beings. It's the harm of the animal industry to the earth, but this real sense of we are friends when I bring it to the animals that get tortured. And um, so I'm, I'm just really uh, sensing how what you're teaching about with radical friendship when we make it conscious, wakes up our relatedness to all facets of this living world. And if we do it consciously, it'll actually change the way we live on this earth. Yeah, I certainly hope so. <laughs> I really do, you know, and I, I love that you brought this to what does it mean to have a radical friendship with the earth itself? And, you know, how do we how do we protect and fortify that relationship in a way that allows us to actually um, live, you know, one of the things that um, I mentioned in the book, uh, Janelle Rose, who is part of the um, Sogoriate Land Trust, she said that, um, you know, they they treat the earth like a relative mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um and to have a sense that this is a, a living being breathing being that has given us everything mm. um and what would it be like to give back rather than continue to take and take and take you know that mm. um it feels It feels like this establishing of a relationship of radical friendship is a is a, a first step and an essential step, and I know that there are more more steps to that journey. Um, I wish that the people who have the most power to shift uh, some of the policies that um, that 
damage the earth or that fail to protect it uh, could have that kind of experience, you know, whether it's to be in nature and to realize like, oh, this is my friend, or even to care enough about their own descendants to want them to have a space that they can, an earth that's inhabitable, where they can actually survive and breathe the air and drink the water and um, have enough food um, and, and to avoid diseases, you know, like we're seeing now. Um, yeah, I think it's an essential first step. And I, and I feel like, well, I already said this, but there's, there's more there in terms of what's needed to bring about the radical and very, we talked about time, you know, like, and this is a case in which we actually don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that the element of friendship and relationship that we're not going to be able to do it without that. And I think that's something that the environmental movement missed, uh, you know, back in the 80s when I first started learning about, you know, I, t I think I told you this story before, but, you know, I was grew up in Chicago. And so um, when I first learned about the environment, I, I was like the save the rainforest was the big like environmental thing. And I and I told my mom one day, I was like, mom, I really hope one day I can go to the environment. And she was like, what do you mean? <laughs> And I showed her my little like Save the Rainforest book with like a toucan on the front. And I was like, here, this is where I'd like to go, you know. <laughs> but I, th I think that, you know, the, the you know, environmentalism, and the environmental movement and the social justice movement were really working on separate projects for a long time. Um, and there was, I think, this tension between people who were like, save the earth and people were like, no, save people, you know. And of course, now I think that movements are, you know, increasingly understanding that complete, you know, interrelationship between the two and that, um, you know, yeah, the people who are most, you know, being impacted now by the, by climate crisis are people who are um, uh, marginalized by society and disempowered by society as well. Um, so I think, how is it that we get people to get together enough to really feel that we are on the same team here so that we can, we can make a meaningful change in the way we relate to our planet um, is a is a big question. I think it's a, the right question. I feel like I hope that friendship can be a part of a part of the answer there. I think it is. Me too. Me too. I'm gonna kind of ask a final wind up. First of all, as many of you just heard. Um, Kate's got a gorgeous new babe, Maple. And I guess what I'm wondering is you've just been momming for the last bunch of months. And, <laughs> you know, is there anything else? You mentioned one thing. Is there anything else that, you know, if you were writing again that you would have wished you included that you're learning from being a new mom or anything else that's emerged that you mm. kind of want to add in? Mm -hmm. I think I'm still really understanding and unpacking the experience of being you know, a black mom in a mat black maternal health crisis in a pandemic on a rapidly heating planet, you know, in the middle of uh, a uprising around, you know, police brutality and anti-black violence. Like that was, that was a lot. <laughs> um, and I feel like, you know, for practical reasons because of the pandemic, but also just for um, personal reasons, like I, I feel like my, my inclination there was to kind of um, withdraw a bit. And I know that's, you know, not uncommon and healthy during pregnancy and you know certainly with the conditions that we had to kind of um like bring it in also i was trying to finish this book <laughs> Just, you know. um one of the things that i'm really curious about now you know as we see the rise of the delta variant and look at you know other potential variants coming forward and you know when i when i was writing this book we were still under the impression that once we got a vaccine this would all be over and now we're learning that that's not um and so there was something else I'd want to include or explore. I guess two things from that experience. One is around like how we um, 
plan to care for each other in times of crisis and disaster, because it does seem that even if, if we take radical action now, um, we are still going to be seeing the impacts of climate crisis for quite some time and um, our societal uh, our societal um, injustices don't seem to be, you know, just going poof, you know, even though the awareness is so is so much greater now. So I think that's part of it. Like, how, how would how might we explore these teachings uh, as they relate to um, navigating navigating crises like the one that the ones we are experiencing now i think i my hope is that people would would take these teachings and and creatively apply them to whatever situation they're working with but i think there's even maybe something more to be articulated there and the second thing has to do with um parenting and, and mothering in particular and um i feel like when we look at some of the social and political crises we're experiencing now, particularly around climate, I think there's something um, that I would imagine parents might have in common, regardless of their party affiliation, in terms of you know how do we make this country and this world a place that is um, safe and generative for children to grow, grow up, and. Um, I would love to explore that more like what does it mean to be you know to, to teach our children about friendship to be to, to partner with each other in solidarity as parents um and also to kind of demand from our social systems that they allow for a little bit more support for parents you know like i i, re I realize in this time of mothering like wow i there's you know no financial support for child care I don't have paid maternity leave like you know there's these you know high um societal expectations and um just really would love for there to be um yeah to, to help support more dialogue both around the um i guess what i'm saying is spaces where we both acknowledge the impossible task, you know, that is ahead of, you know, parents and mothers in this space and work for the sustainability of parents through relationship. And then also um, intend that those stronger relationships help us to transform these systems that, that make our work impossible. It totally resonates. It really does. And it makes sense that you'd be immersed and really seeing, sensing from the inside out the challenges and also how the teachings you've already outlined so powerfully in the book really are the groundwork, but now we need to apply them to these times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much I, to all who are listening. Thank you for being part of this. And I, I hope you feel inspired to not just read the book, but to explore well, what does it mean in your life with people you know, people you don't know to explore developing this very um, rich, juicy, spiritually awakening kind of way of relating. Um, so yeah, I hope you'll read it. And again, Kate, it's just a pleasure to be able to do this together. So thank you, dear. Thank you so much, Tara.